each and every one of you. I uh, invite, invite you to open your Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy, is where we're going to be starting this morning. The book is 2 Timothy. We'll be in the third chapter, looking at verses 16 through 17. And it reads as follows, and I'll be reading from the Legacy Standard Version of your Bibles. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped, having been thoroughly equipped for every good work. Maybe you're like me and you've read this verse I don't know, thousands of times in your Christian life. You've heard it, if you've been here for any length of time, you've heard me quote it quite a bit from the pulpit. And we probably have looked at this and go, yeah, all scripture, that means all of it. And it's good for all that good stuff, right? I mean, we all look at them like, yeah, that's a true statement. Every scripture is good and profitable and can equip me so I'm ready for every good work. And then in our daily Bible reading, we might come across a passage, a chapter, or a book, and we go... Well, what am I supposed to do with that? There's a disconnect sometimes. And I've, I've had it, you've had it, we've all had it. And sometimes we wonder, you know, we recognize this is the inspired word of God, it's profitable for us, but we go, okay, but how does it relate to me? How is it profitable to me? And it's here out of ignorance. We don't know enough about the book or the chapter we're in, or we're just too new in the faith and don't really have the skills yet. But because of this, periodically what I want to start doing is every once in a while we're going to take a book of the Bible and we're going to ask the question, why should I study this particular book? Because each book of the Bible offers a unique contribution to the whole of Scripture. And why the message of Scripture from beginning to the end is salvation in Christ, where you're building up to that or we're looking back to that and we're proclaiming it, each book of the Bible does something a little different. And that's its unique contribution to this beautiful tapestry, this quilt, you will, if you will, of, of Scripture. And so this morning, I invite you to turn over to the Gospel of Matthew and your personal copy of God's Word. And we're going to be asking the question, why should we study Matthew? I have four good reasons for you this morning. By no means are these all encompassing, but I think these really get to the the uniqueness of Matthew's gospel. And we begin with one that took me a little bit while to understand, but I think is the most fascinating. That is, we should study Matthew's gospel to to learn about the Old Testament roots of the gospel. You know, it's interesting to me that Matthew, how he begins his gospel account, is very much like large sections of Genesis or the book of Numbers. We begin with the genealogy about the people we're going to be talking about. But we look at Matthew 1.1. Matthew begins, he goes, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, why do genealogies matter? I, I think I, I probably had this thought as a new Christian, and I'm reading Matthew or Luke, and I think more often than not, I just skipped over the genealogies. Like, okay, yeah, this is ancestors. Let's get to the good part, right? Um, but genealogies trace lineage. They connect history together. You know, there's some interesting names here in Matthew's genealogy. Example, verse 5, you have Boaz, who had, sorry, you had uh, Solomon, who was the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth. Those are two unique names, because those two were not Israelites. That kind of answers the question, well, why do we have the book of Ruth and Esther? Not, excuse me, not Ruth, uh, not Esther, excuse me. Why do we have the book of Ruth in their Old Testament? Why does the book of Judges go out of this way to talk about this incident, about this, this, this harlot named Rahab? Well, that's building up to something pretty cool. 
It ties it together. But really, what we see in Matthew 1.1, that the beginning of the gospel, of, uh, according to Matthew, actually goes, we need to start with Abraham. So if you don't know who Abraham is and his promises, well, that statement doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So Matthew's genealogy shows that this, this, what we're reading here, is not something, it is new, but it's not new, new. It's the culmination of something God's been working at since the days of Abraham and even before then. That's the one major way that Matthew shows us the Old Testament roots of our gospel. A second major way he does that is that Matthew is full of Old Testament quotations and to show their fulfillment in Christ. I want us to turn over to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18. There, in the Sermon on the Mount, we come across a statement that Jesus made. It's after he begins preaching. Some might have said, well, you're a rebel. You're here to kind of destroy the current religious order and build your own thing. You're a radical. That he was, but not in the way that people would have claimed he was. But I find interesting this statement he says in Matthew 5, 18. It says, so truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Many times in Matthew's Gospel, we'll read a, an Old Testament quotation, either Jesus directly saying it or Matthew pointing out by context. And here's how Jesus fulfilled that. You know, one example is found in the 21st chapter of Matthew looking at verses 33 through 46. We talked about this this morning in Bible class, and if, if you weren't there for that, you missed a good discussion, don't worry. Wednesday night we'll be meeting for Bible class and Sunday morning again, and we encourage you to be there at those times. But in Matthew 21, looking at verses 33 through 36, Jesus tells a parable here about the religious leaders of his day and how they are actually carrying on a tradition of how religious leaders have treated the people, uh, the prophets of God throughout history. But let's read here, starting verse 33. Jesus says, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. Now when the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his fruit. And the vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. And again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. But afterwards, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize the inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? And they said to him, He will bring those wretches to a wretched inn, and he'll rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds of the proper seasons. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which, was re uh, which the builders rejected? This uh, became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him to, uh, like dust. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to seize him, they feared the crowds because they were regarding him to be a prophet. What's interesting is Jesus, to, to tell this parable, he actually borrows another parable that was told in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 5, in verse, verses 1 and 2, God there tells a similar parable through the mouthpiece of the prophet about this vineyard. And he did everything for this vineyard. He, he made sure it had good fertilizers, good ground. It was thoroughly irrigated. And the question Isaiah's day was, why then season after season did the vineyard produce worthless grapes? 
It's no coincidence Jesus is taking that parable and telling a similar one from the same elements directed at the religious leaders of his day. Why is it then that these vineyard owners, these vineyard workers, excuse me, mistreated the owner's servants? Now, Jesus doesn't come out right and say it, but the religious leaders understood what they're talking about, what he was talking about. Why is it that the people of God, the, the religious leaders of God's people, mistreated and beat and killed the prophets, and why they would ultimately, at this point, kill the son? Jesus quotes another scripture, Psalm 122, excuse me, Psalm 118 in verse 22 and following, that is, the, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, Jesus quotes that scripture as the fulfillment of that parable. That is, the people's ultimate rejection of the Son is the rejection of the chief cornerstone that God foretold in the Old Testament. Matthew contains dozens of other uh, examples like this, showing the Old Testament connections to the ministry and work of Christ. And so when we ask the question, why should we study Matthew? We, the first answer should be to, to learn about the Old Testament roots of our gospel. How Jesus came as the culmination and fulfillment of everything the old law was pointing to. To bring in the new covenant. To realize grace and truth, as, as John says in John chapter 1, around verse 18 or so. But as we study the Gospel of Matthew, we're also going to find that if we study the Gospel of Matthew, we're going to find out about the nature of the kingdom of God. You know, in Jesus' day, as it is today, there's a lot, there was a lot of confusion about the kingdom. You know, the Jews had been expecting a kingdom since at least the days of Daniel, probably before. But in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, there's mention there of the, that prophecy of the four, these great kingdoms. And Daniel 2.44 talks about the final kingdom that shall be never destroyed. And the Jews were looking forward to that. Now in their day, some thought it meant an earthly kingdom like David's kingdom. That if the Messiah showed up, he was going to destroy Rome, the Roman oppressors, and he was going to rule on earth. It's funny, a lot of people still believe that. That when Jesus shows up, it's going to be a literal kingdom, and it's going to destroy all the oppressors and so forth. And yet, it's interesting that Matthew's gospel emphasizes more than the others, not that the others don't, but more than the others, the nature of the kingdom. One example of this is we, we have parables that reveal the true nature of what the kingdom of God is like. You know, Jesus enters the scene in Matthew chapter 4, in verse uh, 23 there, that after the ministry of John the Baptist is done in Matthew's account, and Jesus comes on and starts preaching, he begins preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And as we look further in the gospel, in the gospel of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount is really the manifesto of the kingdom, that is, how are people going to live in the kingdom? But you look in Matthew 13, uh, where you have a string of parables related to what the kingdom of God is like. Matthew 13, we'll be starting in verse 44. Now, I'm going to summarize the parable of the tares, because that's also about the kingdom. But the parable of the tares is simply that of the, 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 the owner of the, vin, of, of the farm there sows wheat, and the enemy comes in and sows tares, and tares are things that look like wheat but really are weeds. And that one's a parable about the end of the age, of the judgment, where there will be a harvest of the world, that field, and those who belong to God, the wheat, will go to him and the tares will be cast out. So even there in that parable, we learn something about the kingdom. It's about people. But I want us to look in verse 44 through 52 here. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. 
Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up from the, on the beach. And they sat down and gathered the good fish into the containers. But the bad fish they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the fiery furnace. And that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every, uh, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like the head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. But notice here these parables. The first two have to deal with the type of people who belong to the kingdom. It's the people who recognize the value of the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus preached in Matthew 4, 23. These are the people who are willing to go to any lengths possible to get the gospel of the kingdom. You have a man who found a hidden treasure in the field and wanted to make sure he had every right to that treasure, goes and sells everything he has to get the property rights to that piece of land. Or it's like a pearl merchant who finds this amazing pearl of great value, sells all that he has in order to get that one pearl. Now, we could spend the rest of the hour this morning going through statements in Matthew's gospel about Jesus telling us that to be his disciple, we must forsake all else. We have to love him more than mother or father. We have to be willing to take up our cross daily to follow after him. But these two parables here show us the same thing. Those who are going to belong in the kingdom are those who are willing to go to any lengths possible to enter it. And the parable of the dragnet, it's similar to the parable of the tares and the wheat. And that it's talking about a parable of judgment, about what's going to happen at the end of the world. Well, there's going to be a harvest, and, and God is going to sort the righteous from the wicked. Now, what do all three of these parables we read have in common? The kingdom is about the people. Not a physical manifestation of borders and an army and so forth, but the people. And that's something that the Jews struggled with quite a bit in the first century, and, and many people do today. But Matthew shows us time and time again, and we even saw it in the last parable in Matthew 21, 33 through 46. What did Jesus say there to the religious leaders at the end of that parable? The kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produce the fruit of it. And so we learn about the nature of the kingdom of God when we study Matthew's gospel. Now, if there's a kingdom, there is a king. And that's another thing we learn if we study Matthew's gospel. We'll learn about the authority of our king, Jesus. In Matthew 28, the end of Matthew's gospel, this is, the state, this is not the only statement of the authority of Christ in Matthew's gospel, but it's the most explicit, in my opinion. But you look here in verses 18 and 20. Matthew 28, 18 and 20. Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's read verse 20. Teaching them to keep all that I commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In my old Bible, I had a note written next to verse 19, or at least at the bottom there. It was about verse 19. That is, the gospel only makes sense if we understand verse 19. The gospel only makes sense if we recognize and are ready to confess and submit to the absolute authority of Jesus. But if Jesus does not have absolute authority, he can't make statements like he did in Matthew 5. Here's what you're used to hearing religiously, but I say to you, this is how it is. Jesus, as the absolute ruler and, uh, of the kingdom of God, has the right as king to tell us how we are to live in the kingdom. That's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He's the one who has the right to set the conditions to admission in the kingdom. That's what we read in verses 19 and 20. Those who are willing to become disciples of Christ, be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and commit their lives, in verse 20, to the teaching of Christ, those can enter the kingdom.
But if we study Matthew's gospel, we'll see many other things like this section here of learning about the authority of Christ. We'll learn it. We'll see examples of him healing individuals in order so the religious leaders of his day may know that he had the authority to forgive sins. We'll see how he has the authority in Matthew 16 and 18 to describe and tell us what the church is like and how it's to operate and how it's to function and who belongs to it. Because Matthew's gospel, as read in the scripture reading, from beginning to end, is about the promised king and the rule of that king. Matthew's gospel begins with the words of, here is born the king of the Jews, and Matthew's gospel ends towards the end there with, here is hung the king of the Jews, and then it, it really ends with, here is the king risen, and all of his authority is now in, he's there. But if we walk away a study, from a study of the Gospels of Matthew and don't get that Jesus is the king with all authority, we've, we've missed one of the major things that Matthew was trying to teach us in writing his Gospel account. And a final thing for us to consider this morning is not only do we we'll learn about the kingdom and the Old Testament roots of the Gospel and and about the authority of our King Jesus, but Matthew's gospel contains some of the only explicit statements about the heart of Christ. In Matthew chapter 11, and the verse will be 29. Matthew 11, in verse 29. We read the following statement. In Jesus' appeal, his invitation to come follow him, he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. In studying for this lesson, I came across a quote that I rather liked. This author added, he said that Jesus is a king means he has authority. But his authority is exercised with gentleness, humility, and service towards those who trust in him. See, our, our king Jesus is not a despot. He is not some sort of dictatorial ruler who barks out orders with no care or concern for you and I. No, he is a servant king. He was a king who decided to come down and be with the people. You know, I think of that scene from Shakespeare's, I think it's Henry IV, where he disguises himself as one of the soldiers to see how his men are doing to be as a commoner with his, with, his, with his subjects, that he may have a feel for their heart and their condition on the eve of battle. You know, we admire kings who ride, right, from history, who ride out with the troops. We admire the kings who are with the people. We admire the kings who are not some, on some high ivory tower, but the ones who care and concern, have concern and love their subjects. That's Christ. Many times in the Gospel of Matthew, for example, in chapter 14 and verse 14, we read statements like this. He's looking at a large crowd of people, and he says, and it says, and when he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. There's other occasions where he sees a, a large crowd of people that he's teaching, and he felt compassion for them because he saw them as sheep without a shepherd lost and aimless and lacking direction and guidance in life. And I think you see the heart of Christ most on the cross. In Matthew chapter 20. In the verse is 28. This is after two of his disciples had asked for status, 
set us on your left and right hands, and he rebukes them from that kind of attitude or outlook on what the kingdom of God's like. But he points to himself as the ultimate example of servanthood. And he says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. You know, the Hebrew writer in chapter 12, first three verses there, tells us that it was for the joy set before Christ, he endured the cross, despising its shame. He did not relish in the idea of being killed and executed on a cross, but he rejoiced in what the cross was going to be able to do for a people that have yet, yet to have believed in him. That he was willing to go for the cross to demonstrate his own love towards his creation, as Paul says in Romans chapter 5. That this king was not above giving his life for his people. And so when we, when we step back and we look at Matthew's gospel, and we ask ourselves, well, why should I study this particular gospel? You know, as, our, as a, the brother pointed out today, um, you, you look, as Rob Kingston pointed out in scripture reading, we see that God had this plan to redeem man going back centuries, longer than our country's even been around, longer than we can even conceptualize in our brains, that God had been working towards this point in human history. And the funny thing is, once you see the cross and you look back, you're like, how was I so blind? God's been pointing out everything since Genesis 3 that he was going to do this. But it was building up to this moment. And Matthew helps us see that long connection of the long-awaited king with his kingdom and the long-awaited promise of salvation that the king, only the king of the kingdom can offer. And so if you're here this morning and you're not yet subject to the king, you see the love that he has been willing to, that he showed for you on the cross, and you're willing to do what Matthew records for us to do in, in Matthew 20, 19 through 28. If you're willing to be baptized for forgiveness of your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you're willing to give your life over to Christ's teaching to be his disciple, to, to learn all that he commanded his disciples to observe throughout the ages. This invitation's for you. There's water ready. We can assist you right now. But maybe you've done that in the past and you've, you've faltered. You're not living right. You're... you're You've wandered outside the boundaries of the kingdom. You're, you're, you're away from fellowship of God. Well, you can be restored this morning. Or maybe you are in the kingdom of God and you just need strength from your king. You need strength from your fellow citizens. We can pray with you. We can pray for you. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, why don't you meet me down here at the front? Let's get ready to stand and sing the song that's been selected.